Vanessa. Hi, Dom. Welcome to autumn. Yeah, it's fall. I'm somewhat happy about it. Oh, I'm nothing but overjoyed. Mm. No, I'm conflicted. I'm a summer person. Well, speaking of hot summers, today we talk about Israel with Walter Russell Mead, a gentleman, a scholar, author of many books, including Ark of a Covenant, a uh, uh, also the James Clark Chase Professor of Foreign Affairs and Humanities at Bard College, columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and scholar at the Hudson Institute. So in his new book, The Ark of a Covenant, he tries to figure out why is the United States relationship with Israel the way it is? Mm-hmm. And the answer, obviously, is filthy Jewish money. Right. The cabal. The cabal. The Jews. The Jews. Air quotes. So obviously, no, he, his, the whole point of delving into this, this tome was to dispel some of those prejudicial views about uh, the Jews and the Rothschilds and prove that it's not all about the Benjamins to show that the United States doesn't support Israel simply because the Jews are this (laughs) tentacular creature holding the world in its embrace. Bengali types. Exactly. So if you read the book, and I 110% recommend you do, you'll discover that it's more like that in every step of the way leading up to the founding of Israel, the opinion of the Jews probably mattered the least. Mm -hmm. Nor, by the way, is it just about judeophilic evangelicals who are trying to precipitate the end times through Israel because a Jewish homeland in Israel is an integral piece of their eschatology. In fact, one of the best things about reading this book is that in every turn, it shows how unpindownable history is Mm. and that Mm -hmm. any attempt to shove it into a single facile narrative is just bound to fail. Oh, and by the way, worth noting, Walter is not himself of the Jewish persuasion. He's coming at these questions from the perspective of a perplexed Christian who's truly interested in understanding how these foreign policy cliches have embedded themselves in the American mind. So we talk about the reasons that people end up developing false understandings of history. We talk about the trace anti-Semitism and Orientalism that addle the mind of Westerners when they think, talk, and make policies about the East. Mm -hmm. We talk about current affairs at the end, which is, I guess, mostly for uh, foreign affairs wonks like myself. Um, But but we get there and we even, even launch it off by, what a better way to launch it off, with a Matt Iglesias tweet. So... Well, and one thing that was, is interesting about this conversation, and we start off the conversation uh, with this observation, is that usually when we're talking about foreign affairs, we are lamenting the fact that the U.S. looks at the world through the prism of its own understandings and dynamics. And so it kind of places American dynamics upon the rest of the world, even when it doesn't make any sense. And interestingly, in this in this conversation, we talk about why, for some reason, people insist on thinking that Americans have nothing to do with their relationship with Israel. Right, and it's suddenly all America about, has no agency. Right, um, and and so and so we talk about that un, unusual inversion, uh, and and in fact, it is it is as it usually is. It is just America seeing the world through its own prism, but for some reason, it's just not seen as as that reality, which which takes us to. The idea of preconceived notions, if you want to get there. Oh, oh. (laughs) I think I'm going to hold on this wonderful segue. Okay, okay. In order to remind you that we are Uncertain Things on uncertain.substack.com, where you can find extra content, including essays and uh, even a special episode for paid members about the trauma plot as a follow-up to our conversation with Christine Rosen. Wire fans will definitely enjoy that. But bonus content. And if you want to support us 
please give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts because that helps a lot, a lot. And share us with your friends and enemies because, 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 because. So before we go, we have uh, is it an announcement? We have a, a, a proclamation. Fun- <laughs> a fun recommendation for another podcast in in the podosphere that you may also be interested in um, as an Uncertain Things listener. It's called Preconceived. It's hosted by Zale Mednick. It examines the preconceptions that shape how we view the world, and it challenges paradigms by which we live our lives. So on each episode, the host, Zale, he talks to researchers, experts, other luminaries, and he examines, you know, both our approach to how we how we make major life decisions, but he also like examines our perspectives that we may have never really challenged and that we may have been overly conditioned towards. Um, there's a couple episodes that I think will particularly appeal to uncertain things listeners. Um, there's an interesting one on the malleability of human memory, for example, with Elizabeth Loftus. Uh, who's a psychology and memory expert. I enjoyed the one on polyamory with Dr. Eli Sheff. I'm quite curious about uh, relation, non-standard relationships. And so that one was interesting for me to unpack. Um, but there are one a of bunch. our first conversations w- of our, in our lives, in our shared <laughs> lives, Vanessa, was about polyamory, actually. Was and you it? taught me the phrase, yeah, yeah, back in your Harlem apartment. Oh, how? I knew about polyamory in 2014. Look yeah, at I me. Just, I just took the concept for granted and you told me, no, there was a stupid term for it. <laughs> And it's only gotten more popular since then. So yeah. if you're curious about it, you Which can of listen to that episode. The appeal. I don't know. I don't know. Let's like let's shelve that for a <laughs> uncertain things episode. Um, but yeah, so listen up to your conceived wherever you get your podcasts. Check them out. Hooray! Hooray for the ad swap. Hooray! We are we are getting bigger and bolder in this world of podcasting. Yeah, and if you have a podcast that uh, you think our audience would dig, then send it our way, and we can we can do a little promo swap. Let's 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 build our audiences together. <laughs> um, in in this polyamorous podcast yes, world of ours, exactly. And with that, Walter Russell Mead. Let me uh, preamble by saying that I am. I woke up absolutely sick. May or may not be COVID. Who cares? Um, so if I, if I talk nonsense, then just like chuck it to my diseased madness. I'll just take that as a license to a- answer the questions I want to exactly talk about. Exactly my point. <laughs> the ones like that you ask. That's his dementia speaking. I can ignore Ex- it. Okay. Exactly. Just usurp authority and take over the pod. <laughs> so, so, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to introduce you in, in your your great book, The Ark of the Covenant, uh, uh, at the top. I think it's it's an excellent book. And I, really, it's one of those books that I just think everybody should um, read. Anybody who's Adam's mildly been interested. losing sleep at night because he can't stop reading. I really, so. I, I, yeah. and it's true. <laughs> and, there, and there are some parts there that I just, you know, I'm from Israel and it's a topic that I thought about a lot, studied and argued about amply. And yet this is a book that is a necessary compendium. It also made you think in new ways about things that you thought you'd kind of close the book on, so to speak. So one great point, and I think let's start there, is a recurring rant of mine, and I've even recently wrote about this for uh, Newsweek about the, the, the damage in the American conversation to talk about everything foreign affairs through the lens of American politics using the entire world as just mirror to Americanism, um, which, which often mm-hmm. leads to really terrible, dumb, shallow conversations. But uh, reading your book, I realized that <laughs> when talking about this, the core issue of the book, which is the, the relationship between Israel and, and America and, and how it developed, it's actually almost the inverse because People see Israel as it's sui generis, not re- like, as if it's, ha- it's having undue influence in the U.S. and is actually manipulating the, uh, in some way for, and for whatever reason, is manipulating the national interest in ways that are completely outside of the scope of American politics. And in fact, in this particular case, we might use a little more of what I call American solipsism of looking rather than external forces, but at America and asking, why does the United States relationship with Israel look the way it does based on American interests? So let's start there. It's true that that 
a lot of people sort of look at Israel and assume that it has some kind of amazing occult influence over American policy and American politics. We should probably start from the fact that every country tries to influence the politics and policies of other countries. The United States spends billions of dollars a year trying to influence politics and policy in other countries, and we are certainly not alone in that. This is what becomes unusual is that Israel is seen as you know, much more successful than other countries at doing this. You listen to what people say, and it's often, I won't say they're conscious anti-Semites, because I'm really not the moral arbiter of the state of the world's souls. But they fall back and, and reliably use certain classical anti-Semitic tropes. So Jews are more powerful than everybody else because the Jews run the media. And because the Jews are so rich, they just buy everybody. And for those who can't see, uh, Walter is doing air quotes when he says the Jews. Yes, the (laughs) Jews. Oh, okay. Uh, Yes. Because the tone sounded so sincere. (laughs) (laughs) Right. If you couldn't pick up on that. (laughs) Right, right. Uh, I'll have to learn verbal air quotes. (laughs) The art of the verbal air quote. But if you really look at it, there is a much closer relationship between perceived American interests and our policy toward Israel than people might think. I mean, for example, when Israel was small and weak uh, and really could have used a lot of help from the United States, the United States was completely indifferent, in fact, hostile. Under the Eisenhower administration, the U.S. saw Nasser, not Israel, as the key to our Middle East policy. And actually, at one point, we were even discussing with the British a plan to force Israel to give up the Negev Desert as part of a peace plan. Israel, as I say in the book, did not become strong because it had an American alliance. It, it got an American alliance because it had become strong. Really, I think when you, when you look at it, what you find is that American policy toward Israel is actually more like, we make that policy more like the way we make policy toward other countries. But at the same time, the position of Israel in American discourse and in American consciousness is very different from that of really any other country. A comparison I think you make in the introduction, if I remember correctly, which was just so clarifying in taking that same formulation, which applies to any kind of pressure group in politics and the misconceptions around it. Like Democrats focus a lot about the outsized influence the NRA has over Washington. But as you point out, the truth is that people don't love guns because the NRA is powerful. The NRA is powerful because people love guns. There is almost a, uh, I'd say a wishful simplicity in seeing all your political woes associated with one organization that if we can only beat it, if we can only bring down the NRA, then all our problems with with gun proliferation in America will be solved. If we can only undermine APAC or at least <laughs> pry its clutches from the heart of American foreign policy, then there'll be a two state solution. That's right. I think you know fundamentally the idea is that Israel cannot become strong as a state through the normal things that states do: building an army, building an economy technological capability, building an intelligence service, having effective diplomacy. Israel's strength doesn't come from any of those sources. It comes from sneaky Jews doing sneaky Jewish things, controlling (laughs) the media, controlling the banks. So Israel is only strong for people who think this way because the U.S. is backing it. And if we could just break the U.S.-Israel connection, then Israel would fall. And the way to break the U.S.-Israel connection is to attack the, quote, air quote, (laughs) Jewish lobby that is holding that, artificially holding that support in place, allegedly. And so you have, Mm -hmm. in that sense, anti-Semitism is elevated into a strategy of countering Israel. (laughs) One of the things I say in the book is that unintentionally, anti-Semites have all along been some of Israel's biggest supporters and allies because their own anti-Semitism leads them to 
very incorrect analyses and strategically misguided approaches and diverts them. You know, they say in the, in the bullfighting ring, the, the bull is always distracted by the matador's red cape. It goes for the cape, not the legs. And in many ways, historically, Israel has been a prime beneficiary of the fuzzy thinking that anti-Semitism tends to cause. Can you give an example? Well, I think for me, the most prominent example of anti-Semitism helping Israel is when so many Arab countries expel their Jews following the Israeli War of Independence. Uh, Without those Jews today who constitute, Middle Eastern Jews constitute the largest demographic group of Israeli Jews, Israel today would be a much smaller country. Um, There would be no real pressure for settlements on the West Bank. It would also, it would be a much weaker country with a smaller army, smaller economy. And it would also be a much more left-wing country. Hmm. Because if you think about how those Arab Jews have influenced the political evolution of Israel, the Likud party would not be in government without them. Right. And so actions taken sort of by anti-Semitism, trying to punish the Jews for things that Israel have done, actually redounded enormously to Israel's benefit over the years. That's interesting. So I want to I want to pick up on a little bit on this thread of anti-Semitism because you and even in our conversation, but also I think in the book, you may you would you make a distinction between the individual having anti-Semitic feelings towards Jewish people versus a kind of more collective or cultural anti-Semitism that permeates. And I and I want to kind of parse that through because I think that's that's important to understand how that's influencing American perceptions about the American Jewish Israeli relationship. And and you also make the point that when you see kind of the bouts of anti-Semitism in American culture, that tells us more about how Americans are feeling about the American project than about anything to do with Israel or Jewish people themselves. So would you mind kind of talking about this more collective anti-Semitism and what it says about us? Well, you can, you find that going, you know, pretty far back in Western history uh, and certainly achieving a kind of recognizable form in the early Middle Ages, there, you know, there's the sense of this, of the Jews as, as this small minority whose weakness is only superficial. Actually, they're quite strong. They're in league with your enemies abroad. They, have an, they wield an occult economic influence that gives them enormous political influence. And in some ways, this was linked to the weakness of medieval Christian society, where you think about sort of in the, in the so-called Dark Ages, the, uh, the state, say, of France, it's very weak. It's really the king and 20 people who ride around with the king. Uh, there's no police force. There's no government bureaucracy. There's, you know, his, his feudal rents come in the form of cabbages and rutabagas. Um, you know, it's not, it, it's not powerful. And what makes it powerful is opinion, that people believe the king is God's anointed ruler. They believe that the church is telling them to obey the, the king. And so when you have a group of people in the middle of this society who don't share many of these basic beliefs, and because people don't know much about what the Jews think, they don't know which of these beliefs they share and don't share, because actually Jews were being taught to pray for the well-being of the countries that they live in and to obey the laws and so on. But that's, that's not what people know outside the community. So they're seen as a threat to the cohesion of society, all out of proportion to their numbers. And then these medieval societies that are constantly threatened with invasion from the outside – barbarian invasions from the east, the Vikings from the north, the Muslims from the south. The fact that the Jews have or have or are believed to have all kinds of connections and correspondences with people in these other realms makes them even more an object of suspicion. And then you throw um, superstition. Well, if the Jews reject Christ, it must be that they've chose, actively chosen to serve evil. And so anything is possible of people who do this. They are doing witchcraft, they're causing plagues, whatever. 
So the, the figure of the Jew in America, in Western culture, assumes this powerful, threatening aspect, even though the individual Jew in front of you is weak and powerless and really has no protection. Um, now, that cultural meme enters the general sort of culture in ways that people are not necessarily conscious of. So, and also can become disassociated. You can have somebody who has a lot of Jewish friends, but still thinks of Jewish power as some sort of occult thing. Uh, so, and you can have all kinds of people who believe in religious tolerance and so on, and yet also believe in another corner of their minds because people are not necessarily logical or you know, consistent in the way they do things, still have this inherited stock of ideas. And prejudice never recognizes itself. A racist usually won't say, I'm a racist. A racist will say, no, these are not prejudices. These are based on observation. These are facts that I believe. So in, in terms of the American context, then, would you say that American America is more prone to anti-Semitism in moments where it feels like America itself is weaker, like these kinds of influences from Christianity or or Western thought kind of infiltrate more easily when there is inherent feeling of vulnerability in America as a as a I country. Think, I mean, I think that's true, but let's let's draw it out a little bit uh, because one of the things that that I found as I as I researched the book is that the basis of Jewish acceptance in America is subtly different from the basis of Jewish acceptance in Europe. And it's a subtle difference, but it has profound implications for anti-Semitism and the strength of anti-Semitism. In Europe, the, the idea was that if the Jews give up their identity as a people, then the Jews can be accepted as Frenchmen, you're a French citizen of Jewish origin, you're a German citizen of Jewish origin, but you give up the idea that there's a Jewish people of which you're also a member. And this also goes to what we uh, talked about with Tom Holland and Tomer Persico regarding the invention, quote unquote, of religion, where religion becomes a tool that can allow you to have uh, freedom of conscience without an association to the tribe or the people or the nation. And that's the process that you are the Protestantization of all of Europe in a sense where you can it's a, it's a question of denomination that we can be pluralistic about, but you still um, vow your loyalty to the the nation. Right. Well, in the, in the Middle Ages, it was the kind of Christian Republic of Europe that was trying to be a holistic society in the modern period. Each European nation tried to create a smaller holistic society. So Hungary for the Hungarians, France for the French, etc. Uh, and in both places, the, the possibility of the Jews as a, as a minority who share some aspects of the collective identity, but not others, becomes a real flashpoint, right? The American approach to the Jews, the Jewish question, whatever we want to call it, was, was subtly different in that from the beginning, Amer American identity is pluralistic. That is, in 1770, very few Americans thought of themselves as Americans. You were a South Carolinian, or you were a New Hampshireite, uh, or you were a British citizen in, in America, whatever. But the, the union of the colonies is a union of sub-identities. And on the religious level, at the same time, there was a lot of religious diversity, mostly within Protestantism. But so you had Anglicans, you had Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Methodists, Quakers, etc. So that Amer and all of them are all of these sub tribes are under the American umbrella. So the Jew and, and you know then you get immigrants coming in and they basically get treated in the same way. So Irish Americans. Well, they're an ethnic denomination, and they're, they're mostly Catholic. And it was a stretch to include Catholics in a Protestant America, but people managed after, after a certain amount of, of struggle and horror 
uh, to accept them. And the Jewish people, as a religious group, but also a kind of national group, could be seen on the, you know, see, we have Irish, we have Jews, we have Poles, we have all of these different kinds of Americans. And so there was no conflict in the American mind between Jews saying, I'm a member of the Jewish people, the Jewish people are a nation, our nation should have a, a homeland, a state, right? And an Irish person saying, I'm an American, but I think the British should get out of Ireland. And I want American foreign policy not to help Britain control Ireland. So the, the presence of Jews in America from the beginning is based, grounded in, a, in this idea of America as a tribe of tribes, a nation of nations. Now, when we start doubting as a people whether that's really true, for example, if we start saying um, the, this concept of the American nation was actually a very subtle form of white supremacy, it's a way of allowing all of these white groups to come together in order to marginalize people of color. All right. Once you start attacking the, the validity of that, of that historic concept, then all kinds of questions come back to the fore. And one of them is, what's the place of the Jewish? What are the Jews doing in America? Um, who are they? What do they want? What, how do they relate to other groups in the United States? And so at times, you know, during the 1880s and, and early 20th century, when the Industrial Revolution was throwing everything into chaos and we had mass immigration, you saw a rise in anti-Semitism. During the Depression, um, you saw a tremendous rise in anti-Semitism. And I think today we're seeing something a bit similar, where on the left and the right, you have people who are attack who who no longer have confidence that the American dream is a real thing. And it's exactly from those groups in our society where we're seeing a reemergence of anti-Semitism. So uh, it's it's a um I'm trying to remember uh the name uh was it McLaughlin? Father Coughlin. Coughlin. That, so that's like the uh, the unique American anti-Semitism that comes in ages of populism and and vulnerability. But it's can you I, I you're saying that it's a questioning of what the role of the Jew is in American society. But I it's it still seems always foreign to me to the American bloodstream and and, and a different type of anti-Semitism. If you can explain a little bit what the this variant is because it's very different to the to the language and thought of European anti-Semitism. Well, you know, part of it too is that in America, the role of the other that is played by Jews in, in much of Europe is actually their com their competitors for the role of the other. Um, and so is it black people? Is it Hispanics? Is it you know, Chinese coming from the Far East to San Francisco in the 19th century? Um, is it Roman Catholics? And actually, for many Protestant intellectuals um, in America in the early 20th century, the Jews were less of a worry than the Catholics, um, in, part because, in part because at that time, the Catholic Church, you know, actually at an official level was, was anti American in or anti certain principles that were seen as foundational to American life. Um, and so you could, you know, so the Jews were smaller numerically and also less visibly hostile to the core tenants. In fact, enthusiastically for in large part embracing many of the core tenants of American life. I, I, yeah, I want to move to other areas or topics that confound our ability to have a discussion in, in America about its relationship with Israel. At the beginning of the book, you mentioned you have a small list of, <laughs> let's call it confounding variables, and you mentioned Orientalism, and I'd love for you to get into that a little bit. Orientalism uh, was originally, I guess really in its current form, was developed by Edward Said, who was a Palestinian-American 
academic and kind of used it as a as a club against some of the American scholarship, in particular people like Bernard Lewis, uh, who he saw as uh, being pro- anti-Palestinian, pro-Israeli, as part of a larger bias against the Arab world and Arab peoples, which was related to their role, as he saw it, of being intellectuals in service to an imperial project of, of domination of the region. And his point was that the it, calling it even prejudice is almost an understatement, but that the twisted, fetishized perception of the East that uh, European colonialists yep. have developed has permeated all levels of culture to the point that they can't help but produce policies that just view the East as, as an object to be raped right. rather than its own autonomous identity. And this, I think, you know, is not an unfair assessment of some mm-hmm. of the scholarship. I, you know, Bernard Lewis and some other people, I think were much more intellectually serious than, than they're being given credit for. But what I do, what I try to do in the book is, is point back to, particularly in the late forties and early fifties, where the so-called Arabists in the state department and in the British foreign service who were very anti Israel Uh, and in many cases anti-Semitic, were very pro-Arab in their emotional attachments, but their job was to maintain the British Empire in the Arab world and in the American State Department to keep the Arabs from jacking up the price of oil and and accepting the the role of American oil companies in those places. So there, there was a There was clearly an Orientalism there among the Arabists, um, and criticism of it is legitimate. But what I think, then I I, I write about what I call an Orientalism of the left, which is there's a way in which people on the left sort of in their own way kind of fetishize Arab resistance to the West. So that the idea is that every Palestinian is a militant anti-Israeli activist, that every Arab leader is constantly, you know, is going to be triggered if America does something about Israel or, or that Arabs are incapable of seeing or, uh, you know, the Arab hatred of Israel is so all-consuming and all-pervasive that they're unable to sort of differentiate. This is a, this is a form of diminishing the human complexity of Arabs, who are extremely sophisticated players of power politics. And the point here, and to because I can imagine listeners already hearing this as a moral judgment. You know, Orientalism means that Europe sees all Arab nations as good or all Arab nations as bad. It's not just about moral judgment, even it's probably least about moral judgment, but about the oversimplification of yeah. a region and its reduction to a uh, a false vision, and that false vision can be um, infantilizing or that false vision can be idolizing. But the point is both visions are not connected to, like you said, the complexity of human decision making and the internal regional politics. Yeah. I think you point out how Egypt was more in, in the early days of Israel was probably more comfortable with Israel's founding because it created a barrier against the British supported Hashemite family in Jordan. And those those nuances of politics are reduced when you just see everything as the story of the aboriginal, plucky, uh, oriental native fighting against the domineering occidental implant. Right. Now, this is easier to see now with the Abraham Accords, where there's sort of common fear of Iran, plus their common lack of confidence in the United States has led a number of Arab states and Israel to begin to work together. And the Abraham Accords are sort of one visible aspect of a, you know, they're the tip of an iceberg of some deeper cooperation. So the Abraham Accords, in case um, people aren't aware, is the agreements that have been facilitated under the Trump administration, normalizing relationship between Israel and a number of Muslim countries. It started with the Emirates and then it expanded to include Sudan and Bahrain. Bahrain. And I don't know if Morocco is part of the deal, but it's it, but it's it, definitely it, also thawed relations with Israel as a right. result. But in every case, these were 
you know, Arab countries following absolutely traditional raison d'etat, you know, national interest politics, because Arabs are as smart as anybody else and are as capable of developing a sophisticated recognition of their national interests. Now, an an Israeli would be an idiot to think this meant that they love us, right? Um, You know, or that they say, wow, it's a great thing that the Jews came to the Middle East. I'm so glad there's a Jewish state in Palestine. This is not that at all. Oh, let me tell you, there are Israelis who think that. (laughs) Look, You know, there are, you know, there are plenty, look, there, you know, people are sentimentalized international politics in all kinds of ways. And sometimes the people who sentimentalize it are actually policymakers. So it's a complicated reality. (laughs) But the, um, but really, you know, this is, this is simple. This is the Arab world surprising everybody by its ability to behave like normal human beings, which in fact they are and do. (laughs) I wonder. I want to actually jump on this point that the um, people tend to sentimentalize international affairs. I think this is one issue that I keep coming back to, and I'm going to use that as an excuse to talk about the um, what you refer to as the historization of the eschaton, and we'll get into that phrase. But generally, the the part of the American mind that sees or has seen basically from the founding the story of America as being the harbinger of a new world, a new era, and one that will be um, more enlightened and will end up shaping the world in its image. And that that is a combination of the, the myth of progress from the Enlightenment as well as um, Christian eschatology. But I want you to delve deeply into all of that, but just to to frame it into the way that this, I guess, emotional attachment to the narrative of America's historical purpose and direction ends up influencing decision makers in the foreign policy realm. Okay, well, it's certainly clear to anybody who looks at the, the history that even before there was an American republic, one of the characteristics that animated a lot of folks in what is now the U.S. was a belief that the American experiments that the colonists were conducting had some kind of major global consequences, and and these people were operating, you know, out of a certain out of a template that was it's an Anglo-American template that. You know, there was the great ancient world and the Greeks and the Romans and the Jews were noble, wonderful people. And we had a high civilization and Christianity came and you had a great religion. But then come the dark ages and everything goes bad. And instead of Republican liberty, you have tyranny. Instead of true religion, you have superstition, et cetera, et cetera. But then in stages the world starts getting better. And religious people said, God is doing it. Other people came up with the force or whatever is doing it. But first it's the the Renaissance where the knowledge of classical antiquity is uncovered again. Then you have the Reformation, which for Protestants is when the sort of original purity of the Christian religion is restored. Then in England, you have the glorious revolution of 1688 in which the principles of classical liberty are once again being applied. Americans saw the revolution of 1776 as the next step in this. And the scientific enlightenment, meanwhile, is giving humanity the ability to go higher and further than the classical age ever did. And so America comes into the world riding the momentum of this tremendous storm of progress and optimism. And they see, they see, you know, they, they look at the size of the territories that lie open to the United States. They look at America's position as a leading, even in the 1790s, a leading technological country at the cutting edge of so many developments. And they say, it's, uh, it, it must, it's, it's clear that America is destined to be a great power. And and then the hour in human history at which America is is becoming great isn't just another time. It's the time when all when this revolution 
and restoration is moving toward a climax. And so America's rise is the rise of all humanity. Now, one thing they immediately start doing, and you see this all through the 19th century, is they say this new revolution is going to come and uh, rescue the great peoples, the fallen peoples of classical antiquity, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Jews. And so America, when the Greeks revolt against the Ottoman Empire, Americans actually go over to help the Greeks fight and win their war of independence. They raise money for the Greeks and so on. Julia Ward Howe, who wrote The Battle Hymn of the Republic, her husband was a decorated hero of the Greek War for Independence, a New Englander. Uh, And in the same way, the Americans were wildly enthusiastic about the Italian unification. And Garibaldi, they wanted to make Garibaldi a general in the American Civil War, for the Union, by the way, not for the Confederacy. And um, here the idea, too, was these peoples, as they recover their freedom, and if they engage in virtuous democracy, their greatness will return, and everybody will see that the American way works, that it can restore the lost glory. And the Jews, for many 19th century Americans, both both religious and non-religious, secular liberals as well, see them as the great, in a way, test case, that if the Jew, you know, if the Jews return to Palestine, oh, and by the way, in, in, in antiquity, Greece, Italy, and Palestine were all considered these lush, rich places. You read the <laughs> Bible, and Israel is just the land of milk, milk and, honey, and honey. Yeah, right. You read the Greek poets, and it's just this amazingly rich, lush countryside. Ditto Italy. In the 19th century, they were all very kind of poor and backward, malarial, and everything. So, you know. When, when the Jews then finally start going back to Israel, finally, the Americans would say, um, and they start farming, and they start organizing themselves as a democracy, and then they start becoming, instead of becoming despised and marginal, they start regaining their reputation and their, and their uh, standing in the world, and the land is becoming beautiful again, et cetera, et cetera. It's impossible for Americans not to see this as a vindication of these ideals that they developed in ways that had nothing originally to do with the Jews at all, were simply the products of the American spirit and American history. So in some ways, then, the kind of origins of American support for Israel is because it's a manifestation of the American way in the Middle East? Is that accurate? That would be, you know, they would see this, again, as as indicating the ability of American principles to reanimate even the most desperate conditions. And they, you know, they, um, and they believed uh, in the 1940s, you heard this a lot among American pro-Zionists, that Israel would become a very successful country, and then it would be a model for the rest of the developing world. Israel would point the way for other countries because they would see this example and be inspired by it so that they saw this as another stage in the regeneration and development of the world. Again, for religious people, a recovery from the tragedy of the fall of man, and for secular people, the spirit of progress overcoming all obstacles. Is is there a distinction, though, between this kind of uh, sentiment, I guess, towards Israel in terms of the period in American history, too? Because when you're when you're discussing, I'm thinking of, I I remember you wrote about the Blackstone Memorial and all of this widespread support for the idea of Israel way before Israel was an idea on the table for, uh, for the world. Uh, but yet by the time Israel actually starts to come into creation, there's a lack of support because it's not a a particularly uh, strong ally. And so America's not interested in being an ally of Israel. So is this, is this a, a sentiment that 
kind of ebbs and flows? And and if so, why? Sorry, I'm going to do the thing that we said we're not going to do okay. and, and, and tack a question on top of a question <laughs> because it actually, I think, connects because... I, I, I think a lot of this has to do with, um, and I'm going to expand on this later to not distract you from Vanessa's questions, but <laughs> it has to, at least in part, it has to do with the belief that historical progress is almost Hegelian and it's going to take shape without need for direct involvement. These things are a deterministic, mechanistic manifestation. You might support it passively, but you don't need to actually act it out. You don't need to bring it into action yourself. That's, mm. that's the way I see it. And because I see that as core to American yeah. foreign policy in many eras, that we're going to sit back and let history unfold on its own into the destiny that is an American world. Well, I'm going to, I will say that probably Hegelian, very few, uh, very few American policymakers would welcome would there, I was, a yes, I thought about Hegelian. That. Yes, but actually, yes. I, I think this actually is an important difference in the way that sort of Jewish culture thinks about the, the, the end times or the cl- climax of history and the way that American slash Christian culture does, which the, in Judaism, there really is the idea that you can either hasten the arrival of redemption by living a good life and doing good deeds, or you can postpone it by doing bad deeds uh, or abstaining from good deeds. And so, you know, this idea in Christianity is, is, is absent from Christianity, where it's God's providence entirely up to him and there's nothing you can do that will make God, you know, Jesus come back faster, nor can anything you do delay the day of the coming. It's just, will you be ready yourself or right, not? Right. Probably Calvinism was more of an influence than Hegel. Right. But, okay, well, right. Secularized Calvinism, which is kind of the default ideology, I think, of the, um, you know, which is predesti- predestination based basically on iron laws of causation. So Calvinist predestination without God um, is, I think, the default ideology of a lot of the American intelligentsia. Uh, mm-hmm. Hegel is not all that far from it himself, um, but uh, for quite similar cultural reasons. Right. <laughs> uh, but in any case, um, yeah, this, you know, there is, there was certainly a sense that America doesn't necessarily need to protect Israel. You know, if it's God's doing, it will come. Uh, but there is all, but there is an idea, a different idea that's more powerful among evangelical Christians than among many, which is there are verses in the Bible that they take quite literally. One of them is, you know, God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel. So that, you know, you'll actually find people interpreting the fall of the British Empire as a withdrawal of God's blessing for its opposition to Zionists. <laughs> should have stuck with a Balfour declaration. You know, right, you know, you should have the courage of your convictions. Um, and they would note that those were also years in which the British were abandoning their belief in God to a very large, large extent. It's, it's very funny to think after the 40s that, 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 um, that God's involvement in history is guided by deep concern for the fate of the Jews. But I mean, that, that's just me. Well, you know, again, uh, uh, you know, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> but there's, there's actually a great line. I think it's in a novel by Reynolds Price. One of the characters said, God works in mysterious ways, and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I mean, I, I, just find, I just find it so cute and <laughs> quaint. I just find it quaint to, th- to have that belief. And I can, I can totally imagine it being internally reconciled in people because, you know, we all ho- hold insane contradictions and absurdities. But to <laughs> think, ah... The, the, the Brits abandoned the Jews and therefore their empire will slightly shrivel and maybe they'll experience a cold winter and some famine. And as their global influence shrinks, the world will know his will that nobody should mess with the Jews except for dot, dot, dot. Yeah, well, it didn't work that well for Germany either, the 1940s, I can say. Yeah, but I take the hot take that it turned out worse for the Jews. You know, look, but aside from sort of questions of theodicy here, Right. <laughs> Let, you know, um, the thing is that, that 
for Americans, you have to remember that the Cold War becomes then the central contest of good and evil in the late 40s and early 50s. Because their experience is, you know, we turn our back on the rest of the world in the 1930s, and what do we get? A depression and then a world war. And not only that, a world war against the forces of true evil, right? Japan and Germany. Then immediately afterwards, we try to turn our back again. And what happens, like Stalin kills even more, has killed even more people than Hitler. Mao is marching in China. And these people, you know, they avow that they hate God, they hate religion, they hate America, they hate everything about us and basically will kill us if they get the chance. You'll be lucky if they just send your kids to a gulag. That'll be the lucky ones. Oh, and they have nukes. And they have nukes, exactly. So you have, you know, you have the, the total focus of American thinking about the world goes to that. And both American foreign policy and American public opinion tend to center there. And Israel in the 40s and 50s is not an asset as Americans see it to their Cold War strategy. Now, we can also add, by the way, uh, um, as I write about in the book, Stalin actually did a lot more to uh, support the creation oh, of this Israel chapter. than Truman did. And actually, what, what the Israelis did was behind America's back. They uh, transferred badly needed hard currency to Czechoslovakia, which helped the Czech communists solidify their control following their, their coup, and which also uh, enabled Stalin basically to keep them out of the Marshall Plan. Vo you know, it strength Israel st deliberately and not knowingly took actions that strengthened Stalin's hand against the United States. Now, the Americans don't know this in the spring of 1948, as far as I've been able to see. That knowledge filters in later. But if you want to understand why the Eisenhower State Department absolutely focused on the fight against communism, really had a problem with Israel, it's not hard to see why that would be the case. Also, a moment to go back be to the brief moment when Stalin is is playing his Zionist card um, in between, um, you know, planning to purge all the Jews and being completely uh, um, anti-Zionist as seeing it as an internationalist cabal. Um, in that brief moment, it's a great reflection. And that's why I loved the Truman chapters, the Truman section in your book, because it's, and a perfect encapsulation of how history <laughs> is not a narrative. It is, it is not a, a path or a destiny, but is the result of human decisions and political interests that just shift and collide. And, and random occurrences. Yes, the total chaos of history is on display. So if you can talk about the Stalin moment and how it ended up pressing Truman to, to pull the trigger... Well, you know, the, you have to start here. One of the legends, in a sense, where both um, sort of the American Jewish community in its collective memory and, you know, anti-Semites and anti-Israel conspiracy thinkers combine is this idea that it was America, the American Jewish political pressure on Harry Truman in 1947-48 is what drove his Israel policy. And that's that's a kind of a standard reading of the history that both pro-Israel and anti-Israel people have tended to collude with in. But you really look at what was happening. For, for the anti-Israel, obviously, it's the, the notion of, of sneaky um, Jewish intervention. And for Jews, it's the story, or at least for Zionists, it's the story of a very effective, like the most effective act of diplomacy on the part of Chaim Weizmann and the Zionist apparatus. Right. And it's also... In America, for the American Jewish community, there's especially little Eddie Jacobson. At a key moment, Truman's old business partner from Missouri, you know, a one small, not famous, not rich Jew from the hinterland comes into the White House and like Queen Esther in the Bible, he pleads the case 
of his people to the moody Gentile ruler. And Truman listens, and Chaim Weizmann is invited in, and then there's a conversation, and Israel is saved, and the littlest American Jew can move mountains, all right? That really is a story that is important in the, in the American Jewish community, at least in, in parts of it. Uh, and parts of that story are true. And, you know, uh, Eddie Jacobson did get in to see Truman. Truman was very moody. And, uh, and, and Jacobson did persuade him to see Weizmann, and Truman and Weizmann met. But what is very interesting is that after the meeting, Truman did not change his policy. And Truman continued to actually try to prevent the declaration of, Jew, of Israeli independence right up until the declaration was signed. The last thing the Israeli authorities, well, at the time that the Yeshuv, the, the Jewish community in Palestine, the last, last thing it did before declaring independence was to vote to reject an American request for delay. Truman had offered to send his private plane with anybody who wanted to mediate to try to, to, to stave this off. So Eddie Jacobson did not change Truman's policy. Uh, neither did Chaim Weizmann. Um, Truman was, was all along trying to solve a, a bigger problem in American foreign policy. And that is that um, after the end of the Second World War, American liberals had sort of two ideas, and and they were the dominant force in the Democratic Party. They were led by Henry Wallace, who had been Roosevelt's vice president, and Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt's widow. And they wanted to follow Roosevelt's World War II policy, which was to kind of conciliate Stalin and base American policy on trying to win Stalin's trust while working through the United Nations as the chief seat of diplomacy, because only the United, a strong United Nations could prevent World War III in a nuclear era. An incipient institution. Right. It existed for what? All of uh, a year at that point? Yeah, it was very, very new. And, and the hopes for it were, you know, we look back on them, it's kind of sad to see what people hoped it could become. But th- those hopes were very real. In the aftermath of a terrible war, um, their psychological hold was very strong on a lot of people. Um, and Truman saw fairly early that Stalin could not be trusted. There was absolutely no way the United States could reach a- an agreement with Stalin. And he was. And if you were really going to oppose Stalin, you kind of had to work with Britain because there was no one else left to work with. No one was left standing after World War II. So um, uh, how do you, but the Democratic Party doesn't believe this and doesn't like Truman. Uh, He was, you know, the liberals hated him. Truman is constantly trying to manage the pressure from the left in his administration. And his biggest stroke of luck is that in uh, the winter of 1947, the British economy collapses due to huge storms and a big freeze in, in England, and they, they give up the empire. They basically say, we're getting out of India, whether there's an agreement between the Muslims and the Hindus or not. We're going to pull out of Greece and Turkey, and the Americans, that's what drives the Americans to do the Marshall Plan. And we're going to throw the Palestine mandate, which they got for under the League of Nations, We're going to give that to the U.N. and and wash our hands of the future of Palestine. So at that point, Truman can separate the Palestine issue from U.S.-British relations. That's a side note, because again, part of my interest here is just to see how the <laughs> the history of ideas has uh, uh, and narratives has a much smaller part to play than the sheer chaos of decision making. Abandoning the mandate and their presence in India, it was not because the British government and public turned against the project of empire building all of a sudden. Both parties agreed about that. Maybe there was debate about the the, the size and extent of the empire, but there was a consensus that empire was a good thing. What changed was that 
1947, they suddenly couldn't afford to keep it anymore. Right. Well, they had to f- try to find cheaper ways to, to advance their national interests, which, you know, and they, and they worked at it. They continued to play the Arab card against the Israelis right up through Suez. Um, you know, so they didn't completely throw in the, the cards after this, but they, they knew they couldn't afford an army in Palestine fighting a war against the Jews. Um, and so once that happens, um, in, in the U.S., Truman then immediately says, yes, let the U.N. decide. And you have to understand what an important thing that was for people. These wars, between, we think of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict almost as this unique thing. But to people at the time, it looked a lot like these conflicts that have been driving Europeans and the world crazy for 100 years. Bulgarians versus Macedonians, Croats versus Serbs, Poles versus Germans and Russians, Germans and French over Alsace-Lorraine, Greeks and Turks. These national conflicts between people had been the cause of war after war after war. And because these smaller conflicts would draw in the great powers, that's how you would get to the great wars. And so the hope was that the UN could settle this question uh, peacefully, the Israeli-Palestinian question. And when Truman said, I'm going to support the UN decision, he immediately, the Democratic liberals are happy with that idea. Um, And then, you know, these Zionists are trying to get Truman to say, okay, well, now you're the U.S., the most powerful country in the the world. You need to get in there and make sure the U.N. does the right thing. Truman says, oh, no, I can't violate the sacred independence (laughs) of the United States. He, He says, no, 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 we will not even be on the committee to decide. Hands off. Let the U.N. work. And the Zionists are frustrated, but the liberals are thrilled. And that's, it was the liberals, not the Zionists, who were chi- who chiefly concerned Truman politically. Then, all right, then the Soviet Union endorses partition, which, again, to liberals looks like, wow. The U.S. and the Soviet Union acting through the U.N., are mandating a peaceful resolution for a national dispute. This is it. This is the dawn of peace. This is what foreign policy needs to be, and it's working, thank God. Or this was patented Russian trolling. (laughs) Well, you know, Stalin Stalin was a very clever man, and he (laughs) thought a lot about what he did. But it really did, you know, but then the problem is immediately after the U.N. votes for partition, um, the Arabs reject it. And they have, you know, as I say in the book, they actually have a pretty good moral claim. They say, look, you know, Britain didn't get this from the League of Nations. It was imperial banditry. They took it from the Ottoman Empire after the war and then gave it to the Jews in the Balfour Declaration without any consent of the, of the inhabitants of the land. This is imperialism. This is not moralism. Mm. And the UN can have no right to do what is wrong. Uh, so it was a principled stand. But for American liberals, this was totally unacceptable because, you know what, we all have to compromise if we're going to avoid World War Three and have the rule of law. Everybody has to give a bit and get a bit, et cetera. So when the mm-hmm. Jews accept the partition plan and the Arabs reject it, then support for Israel becomes a liberal as well as a Zionist cause. The, the reason that, that this also connects to Stalin is not just the pressure of the UN vote, is the fact that by, by um, helping the Zionist Yeshuv get weapons when no other country is um, supporting it, it gave it leverage that it would not have otherwise had. Well, that's, you see, the thing immediately after the partition vote, the State Department imposes an arms embargo on the region. The Zionists are furious because after all, oh my goodness, this is like the embargo on Franco Spain. It helps the bad guys and hurts the good guys, the embargo on on all of Spain. And the British can supply the Arabs with weapons. It's an American embargo, but the Jews have no place to get them, right? Stalin, 
then that's when Stalin tells the Israelis through intermediaries that they can buy not just any weapons, but weapons that the Skoda arms factory in Czechoslovakia had made for the Wehrmacht and which were, were still you know, in their crates when the, when the Germans surrendered. So Stalin supplies the Israelis with Nazi arms. Some beautiful poetic history there. Uh, and that's, you know, that turns the military tide, it literally turns the tide in the war. Because in the winter of 1948, the Jews are actually losing the war. And even as late as um, the first week of independence, that's when the Etzion bloc falls to really the first intervention by a professional Arab army, the Jordanians. So almost all the leading military opinion, uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, General Marshall in the U.S., believes that the Arabs are going to win the war. But they don't know that Stalin is providing this steady stream of high-quality weapons. Just to put all those threads together, because this is just what's so interesting to me about this, <laughs> you have the chaotic systems that lead the British to leave the mandate when they do, like the bad winter, the famine, which to the world then seems to almost guarantee implosion in Palestine. In terms of American policy, they see it almost inevitably ending with one genocide or another, yeah. the moment that there is no more British policing in the region, and then they have to decide how to handle this. Truman for domestic political expediency, decides to defer to the UN, which ends up supporting partition, and which gives some moral standing to the Zionist Yeshuv, all while for completely different geopolitical stratagems the Yeshuv gets from Stalin the weapons it desperately needs in order to avert complete and total collapse. And if it weren't for this dynamic of power, not only that Yeshuv would not have declared independence, the US would probably have not been compelled to necessarily um, um, support independence in the UN because they realized that as things stood, Stalin was going to get in front of it and support independence for the Jewish Yishuv, meaning that the U.S. couldn't stay neutral. So put together, it's just such a beautiful painting of chaos that forced Truman's hand more than any conversation with Chaim Weizmann. You could say that not since the Red Sea is such a random con uh, constellation of events <laughs> led to such a dramatic result. <laughs> so, so I wanted to close the loop on the previous question because I, I, I still I'm still a little bit uncertain about how America shifts to this point from that previous point. Okay. And I threw out the term Blackstone Memorial without actually explaining it. So I think it might be it might be. If you wouldn't mind exp explaining that moment in American history to to this moment that we just talked about, kind of with okay. the creation of Israel and how the Amer how American in in uh, history is influencing the way we're we're thinking about an, an a Jewish state. Okay. And then I want us to get to today because I definitely don't want to yeah. let you leave without talking about today. <laughs> All right. Look. Well, one of the things in, in trying to show the importance of non-Jewish American support in American history and to show the roots of American support for the idea of a Jewish state in the Middle East, I look at this mysterious document called the Blackstone Memorial, which is delivered to President Benjamin Harrison um, a, a couple of years before Herzl wrote Der Judenstadt, and when there really was no seriously large-scale organized Jewish Zionist movement at all. And this is a petition asking the U.S. to use its diplomatic influence to get other countries to use their influence to get the Ottoman Sultan to declare a Jewish national home in Palestine. And it's signed, this petition is signed by John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, the Chief Justice of the United States, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and a whole galaxy of important, influential American establishment figures. Uh, and this, you know, the, uh, but this memorial is limited in what it asked the president to do. It says, it doesn't say send troops to establish it. It doesn't say America should directly impose this on the sultan right? Diplomatic influence to achieve a Jewish state. And if you look at it, that actually defines American policy right up through the Truman administration, you know, and 
pro-Zionist lobbying could never push U.S. presidents to go farther than those Blackstone principles. Diplomatic support. Um, And anti-Zionists could never get the U.S. to take it off the table. But it has remained. And actually, a hundred years ago in September, uh, September 1922, almost exactly a hundred years ago as we speak, huge majorities in both houses of Congress, bipartisan majorities, embodied the Balfour Declaration into American law as a reflection of these Blackstone principles, so to speak. Um, and for Zionists, it was a very frustrating thing because the U.S. was, for many Jews, the U.S. was on the record as diplomatic support. But then when there were issues, like the British start to limit Jewish immigration into Palestine, the United States, you know, is perfectly willing to have a diplom- an ambassador say to the British, my dear chaps, I wish you would allow more Jews in. But when they say, well, no, we're too worried about what Mussolini might do or whatever, that's the end of the conversation. So it's it's kind of... And just ironically, um, in that same period of time, the U.S. Congress, almost the same year as the Blackstone Memorial was, as the Balfour Declaration was put into law, the U.S. Congress did the single most important thing the U.S. has ever done uh, uh, for the state of Israel, which was it banned mass migration from Europe to the United States without immigration restriction. And again, this you could argue is anti-Semites helping Israel. Uh, without the ban on Jewish immigration, effective ban on Jewish immigration in the U.S. after 1924, some still got in, but much like 10 percent or less of previous numbers. And there, the ban was not directed at Jews. No, it was well. It was it was directed at mass immigration from Eastern Europe, which can, coincidentally were the countries where Jews also right. would live in. But yeah, it hit the Poles, the Italians, the Greeks. It's the Russians, et cetera, as well as the Jews. And German Jews, ironically, had better chances of getting in than Polish Jews. But um, uh, that act was, was entirely rejected by the American Jewish community, while the American Jewish community was much more divided in its attitude toward the Balfour Declaration. The most prominent American Jews of the day were totally opposed both to Zionism and to the Balfour Declaration. It's important to to just emphasize one of your main points, which is the creation the creation of a Jewish state has a lot less to do with what Jews have ever wanted and has a lot more to do with what non-Jews have wanted as a right. quote-unquote solution to the problem. Well, I did consider making the subtitle of the book, Don't Blame Israel on the Jews. Right. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it's clear, it, it really did become clear to me on the research of this that the secret weapon of the Zionists was never massive Jewish power and influence wielded in the conspiratorial way that anti-Semites always think it is. It's that the Zionist project was the only project for the survival of a significant number of Jews that could get just enough Jew, uh, non-Jewish support so that with incredibly intense work and dedication, you could make it work. The other sort of programs for Jewish survival that were kicking around, say, in 1900 were, you know, number one, let us be just like let us live as Jews, religious Jews, not religious, don't bother us, let us (laughs) be. And the Jews could not get that one done. Yeah. You know, it just wouldn't happen. <laughs> the second one is, okay, well, if you won't do that, at least let us move to some place where we can live freely. But one by one, the countries of the world effectively shut their doors to Jewish migration. With the famous quote from the Australian delegation that I love reminding my Australian friends uh, from the Evian conference, I think yes. it's uh, 37 or 38, they're saying, well, we do not quite have a Jewish problem and we'd rather well, not import one. We have a ra- right. We have we don't have a race problem, right? Right, and we'd rather not import one because if Australian history is known for one thing, it's the lack of racial tensions. Yes. <laughs> but the, so that the the weirdest of those three projects, the least likely, the crazy idea, as it literally struck all kinds of people in 1900, that a Jewish state be constructed in the Middle East, turned out to be the only one that was practical. And Mm. that is where Zionism gets its success. And what made it practical 
was the combination that Zionism could mobilize the effort of Zionists. You know, what is it? Another acre, another goat, the incredible, hard, hard, backbreaking work and poverty and everything else to build the state. Um, but also the political thing of building a state, not simply a colony. Um, so I, I, I think this dynamic is part of what complicates uh, the asinine discussion about what counts as anti-Semitism, is anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, or not, because not just today where so many Jews, um, American Jews and European Jews have um, severe reservations about the state of Israel and its conduct, it, as as you point out, historically, there is very little link or, or and, and the link is not guaranteed at all between between the success of Zionism and Jewish public opinion. But at the same time, you see how talk about the power of Zionism is still infused by the perception of a Jewish cabal pulling strings. Right. So I want to move to today. And what better place to start than uh, our source of knowledge, Twitter? which I don't know if you frequent. So last week, journalist Matt Iglesias of Slow Boring had this to say, and I'd love your reaction. He wrote, The Iran deal is good for the United States and good for Iran. That's what makes it a deal. Because it's good for Iran, some other countries in the region don't like it, which I totally get. But these are, quote-unquote, allies that don't do anything for America. And then he adds a meme showing... I receive support in regional conflicts with adversaries. You receive literally nothing. Obviously, he also talks about Saudi Arabia, and he mentions the uh, the tepid response from Saudi Arabia in terms of alleviating gas prices, which I don't know if we fully understand how, how much the Biden trip there uh, worked out. But but he obviously also implies Israel, and, and specifically he points out that um, Israel's only contribution to the U.S. right now in terms of its alliance is intelligence about Iran. In other words, the only thing that Israel is worth as an ally, according to Iglesias, is being able to provide intelligence about the original enemy it needs the U.S. to combat. Do you agree? Look, I think uh, I ask myself sometimes, what would happen if Israel decided that it no longer wanted to be an American ally? Um, or America decided that it no longer wanted to be an Israeli ally, and so Israel had to go shopping. All right. Would Israel be able to find new allies? Absolutely. You know, Russia, China, India, Japan, other countries would stand in line to be Israel's ally. Um, it's tech uh, capabilities, it's intelligence, which is not only about Iran. It knows many things about many people that Americans and others would like to know. But also, it's deep knowledge of American tech and American uh, uh, planning. Uh, these are tremendous assets. Um, and this, this, again, uh, some of this traces back to a kind of fantasy that poor little Israel has no, you know, is so dependent on the United States that it really doesn't dare, you know, if we put our foot down, it wouldn't dare to cross us. And if we, if we just wrote it off, it would suffer and we would not. That is not the reality of this relationship. Um, in fact, I, you know, uh, it, it strikes me as just remarkable, you know, for year, decades, American presence you know, would have given anything they had to get peace between Israel and more Arab states. We have this handed to us now essentially on a platter. Um, and rather than being part of a, de you know, uh, rather than people being able to argue that Israel is a destabilizing force in the Middle East, clearly the sort of creation of a Gulf defense community with Israel involved and the sort of economic links that are developing and all you know, is, is, is in the American interest. Um, Impli I guess implicitly, um, if I read it as charitably as possible, though it didn't make that explicit, the benefit of the Iran deal to the U.S. would mean less headaches in the Middle East and therefore more bandwidth to focus on China. Right. 
is yeah, that I, just, I don't believe that. Um, you know, I look at places in the Middle East where Iran has a lot of influence, you know, and what do we look at Iraq, uh, look at Lebanon, look at Syria, <laughs> look at Yemen. Poster boys for stability. Do we actually want more of the Middle East to look like that? Do we want Iran essentially to intimidate other countries? Do we want the Saudis and the Israelis to be so concerned with the declining value and the, and the Emiratis and others of American security assurances that they turn to the Chinese? Or these days, I think the Chinese and the Russians. Um, this, is, this is not something we want. Uh, there is, I, it, it's important, though, in, in trying to understand how people think about this, I think that it's important to understand that the Democratic Party's dislike of Saudi Arabia has about 70 years of history to it. It actually goes back to the early Cold War when, when the Democrats were angry at, at the Eisenhower administration for siding with the Arabs against Israel. And they saw this as siding with oil companies and, and arbitrary rulers against democracy, democracy. Yeah. Right. Then in the 70s, you get the, uh, the oil embargo and the price hikes. And so the Saudis are like, you know, the, the great traitors who are stabbing us in the back on oil prices and destroying the living standards of blue collar Americans by unconscionable monopoly behavior. Then you get to um, uh, 911, and it's this, you know, 19 Saudis or whatever on that plane. And the Saudis are good friends of the Bush family. The Bush family and the Saudi royal friends have a connection. So we forget it now, but George W. Bush was once just almost as much hated as Trump is. And the Saudi sort of connection with him was massively infuriating. And then, of course, the, the next stage is Saudi opposition to the Iran deal of the sainted President Obama. And beyond that, then, Saudi as the largest producer outside the U.S. of hydrocarbons and destroying the planet and encouraging the addiction to oil. So you're saying the hatred of Saudi Arabia was an overdetermined question. Yes, exactly. And so that people, a lot of people look at the Middle East through a lens in which this view of Saudi Arabia is really deeply entrenched. Now, I am not here to make the case for Saudi Arabia, land of tolerance and freedom. <laughs> um, nor am I you know, here to make the case for let's burn all the oil we can and heck with the atmosphere. But national, the national interest is a very complex thing. And sometimes, uh, you know, Almost no matter who in the Middle East, we're going to be working with people uh, who, in, in certain very basic ways, see things differently and behave differently than we do. What I find funny is that it also seems to assume that Israel is just going to take it if Iran becomes a nuclear power. It, Iglesias' opinion doesn't seem to really factor in the destabilizing power to the world if Israel decides to go to war against Iran especially considering that China will inevitably play some role in this. Well, this, again, this is, I think, you know, the real problem is I don't think the Iran nuclear deal, as I am not against, by the way, um, a nuclear deal with Iran. And I, I would have, I, I was sorry that President Trump uh, left the deal. Right, but returning to a similarly structured deal two, three years after Iran has gained more nuclear advantage, uh, as if nothing's happened, is right. insane. Well, again, what I said that even, even before that, what I would say is that, however, the Iran deal did not contribute to regional stabilization, which is the American goal. That is because Iran doubled down on its destabilizing activities around the region and because other countries so alarmed by the prospect that the U.S. was negotiating the, on the nuclear front, but not on the conventional front and the destabilization front, and that the U.S. seemed to be, in fact, wanting to use the Iran deal as a, as a reason to get out of the Middle East, leaving them more exposed to a stronger Iran. Actually, the Iran deal contributed to destabilization in the region, and I think it's, that's still happening. 
just to be fair, that the inability to predict or really think through the foreign policy decisions is not just on the Iran, the pro Iran deal side, because as we know, Trump's pulling out of the Iran deal also, and the um, maximum pressure policy actually incentivized a lot of creativity inside Iran that made it more insulated. And for instance, it developed its own uh, uh, halal internet that allowed that, that basically made it much more difficult for dissidents inside the country to communicate with the rest of the world. Let's just say that, you know, if you think that that sanctions are enough to change your regime's nuclear behavior. <laughs> Study the history of North Korea. And one of the interesting things, by the way, was that during COVID... Just five more years. Just, we were just five more years away before this collapses. That during COVID, North Korea actually imposed sanctions on itself in isolation, much tougher than anything the international community would ever be able to impose. You know, to the point of actual starvation for people. <laughs> and so that's kind of a demo. I, I don't see the mullahs being moved by sanctions alone. And that, um, you know, anybody who thinks that that's a resolution has it wrong. And in fairness, the Obama doctrine, at least in theory, was the Iran deal was supposed to give them more time to encourage popular resistance, not thinking that this... And that, again, is equally illusory. Um, Mm. These regimes have studied... Gorbachev died recently. These regimes have all studied China, Russia, Iran, what liberalization means. They're they're not going to go down the Gorbachev, Glasnost, and Perestroika Mm. thing again. And it's a total illusion that they're... That, you know... I mean, miracles can happen, but short of that... Um, Iran is not, the moderates in Iran aren't on the verge of pulling off a great liberalization. Okay, I'm going to sneak in my my closing question here, and I'm going to say it fast, hopefully. So we talked earlier about the kind of the plan A, plan B, plan C, and that uh, the, the Jewish state was actually plan C. But there is an argument that plan A is feasible, the plan to have uh, countries just allow Jewish people to be. And I think that's probably one of the strongest arguments for that case is America mm-hmm. and, Amer- and the liberal democracy in America. Mm-hmm. So one of the things we've talked a lot, a lot in this podcast is why liberal democracy matters and why we have to safeguard it. So for my final question to you, Walter, I'd like to hear you to hear your case for uh, if liberal democracy has a chance to actually safeguard minority populations like the Jewish peoples as a viable uh, right. means of, of protecting not just Jewish peoples, but all, all kinds of minorities right. in, in American well, society. One thing I would say is probably that's not the best way to try to frame the debate over liberal democracy is mm. it's good for the Jews. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there might be better. But I, I, look, I think it is true. No, but I think the bigger question is, like, is can do we is there still hope for the idea of a liberal democracy actually safeguarding minorities? Right. Right. Or is right. that okay. also an let's, illusion of the Enlightenment? Right. Let's remember that um, Israel is, because I say in the book, Israel is a country of Jews for whom Herzl was right, that liberalism would not save the Jews. America is a country of Jews for whom Herzl was wrong where liberalism did save the Jews. I think what this tells us is that there's nothing set in stone here. There's no, there's no automaticity. Um, I think in general, Jews can do well under liberal democracy, but I note that Weimar Germany was a liberal democracy. So there we are, in a way. Uh, I don't think you can give a categorical answer. I think we should fight for liberal democracy because it is the least bad of all forms of government. I think we should uphold the American idea because it does provide a common tent under which people can rally without having to give up the elements of their own communities and lives and identities that make sense to them. But, you know, I'm a historian, I'm not a prophet. So Mm -hmm. I'll be always there. Yeah, my add-on would just be we need to safeguard the things that that keep that allow these uh, principles to to safeguard the rights and everything. Well, that's I'm, that's the only thing. I'm I all for liberal add. democracy, and I'm all I you know I'm four square for the American Constitution. Let me just <laughs> put that on the record. <laughs> so, in the last minute, uh, what do you think about the Israeli-Palestinian peace process? <laughs> uh, I I would like it to succeed. I don't see a lot of short-term prospect for that happening. 
and you should read the book to yes. learn about the MacGuffin. The Ark of the Covenant. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so, so much. much this was fantastic. Well, thank you. When does it go up, by the way? The eternal question asked again. You can follow Walter at WR Mead on Twitter. And you can follow us at Uncertain Pod. Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. We are uncertain.substack.com or wherever you get your podcast. Share us with your friends and enemies. And if you're feeling generous, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. Until next time, stay sane.